Alrighty, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, today's class is a learning module all about the hips. If you're new to me, I wanna welcome you especially. My name is Brenton, so you know who I am. We're working through a free yoga program through the year called How to Move Your Body. Uh, so today we're just doing a learning module about our hips. So no movement required, unless of course you wanna kinda of get up and feel around as we start going over some of these concepts. Um, my hope is that these concepts will be really helpful as we move forward into more movement focused practices so we don't have to stop and go over these concepts then we can just kind of get down and dirty into our movement so in talking about the hips and even just thinking about the hips you know when i first started doing yoga that was very confusing to me uh, prior to yoga i had really no anatomical understanding of my body. I didn't really even have any sort of movement practice. So I was coming into it with fresh, with a fresh mind. And uh, really my only background was like seventh grade gym where I learned like, okay, the muscles on our front of our legs are called our quadriceps and the back of the legs are called the hamstrings. Uh, so when I went into yoga and I started hearing all these new terms, I started hearing the term hips and I was very confused by it because I was like, what does that mean? Like, are we talking about my back? Am I talking about my leg? Am I talking about my butt? Like, what am I talking about here? So let's define this a little bit. For our purposes, the, the hip is comprised of two pieces. The first piece is the head of the thigh bone, which doesn't look exactly like this, but close enough. If you ever played with Barbie, very similar. It has like this big round sort of bulbous head on the top of it, uh, technically called the greater trochanter, although for our purposes, you don't need to memorize that. And it plugs right into a little hole on either side of the pelvis called the acetabulum. So something like this. Uh, in here, within here, there's three really thick, dense ligaments that hold it together and make it really stable. And then of course, surrounded by cartilage, in, in the hips case, remember the cartilage in our knee was called the meniscus, now the cartilage in our hip is called the labrum. Uh, the pelvis, uh, I'm just gonna refer to it as one thing, but really it's three bones that are fused together during puberty. And so we can kind of look at some of these kind of features of the pelvis as landmarks that can be really useful to us when we go to do some movement. So the, the pelvis, the first landmark I'll go over are these little bony protrusions on the front. For our purposes, I just like to refer to them as frontal hip bones because I feel like most people can kind of understand what that is without having too much background. But if you don't know where those are for you, take your hands, feel for yourself, like where are they? Little bony things, like they're, they're, they can be kind of long. Now, as I mentioned, these are called the ASIS. Uh, a stands for anterior, which means front of the body. You'll see that word kind of pop up uh, frequently if you start looking at more of this anatomical stuff. So uh, anterior and then superior iliac spine. That just gives it a, a, a specific location on the pelvis because one of the bones of the pelvis is called the ilium, so iliac spine. This is one of the landmarks. I'll often cue like, notice what your hip bones are doing all this kind of stuff. We'll learn more about how to make this useful to us, but right now I think it's just important for us to understand what it is. This has a counterpart on the back of the pelvis called our PSIS. PSIS, you can't feel as much as you can see it. So it's kind of like, and I don't even think you can see it on me, but there's these little dimples on the back. And so PSIS, it's mostly the same letters, right? It's just that the P stands for posterior, which means the back side of the body. So anterior, posterior, superior iliac spine. What this is referring to is either side of our SI joint. Our SI joint is where our low back sacrum right here connects to the pelvis. So it actually all comes together back here. We'll learn a little bit more about that relationship when we move on to our spine module. So we have these two areas of the pelvis. For me, I kind of think of them as like the top, like the, the, the like points around, markers around like the rim of a bowl. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, we will learn how to apply that to our movement. A couple of other areas on the bottom of the pelvis that I think are important for us to know are our sitting bones, which are back here, um, the bottom back side of the pelvis, and then the pubis bone right on the front, which you may have heard if you take some yoga classes where they like to use fancy anatomical terms, you might hear like, take your pubis in, or don't let your pubis fall forward, I don't know. Um, but these are the different kind of areas of the pelvis that I think are useful for us to have a little bit of an understanding about. So now that we kind of get the, the structure of the, of the hip, 
two things coming together, head of thigh bone, pelvis. Hip movement is then any time that the leg is moving in the hip socket, thigh bone's moving in the hip socket, or any time that the, let's say that your leg is stable, any time that your pelvis, your hip socket is moving around the thigh bone. So in one case, one instance, you can see I'm holding this really still so that I can really get this movement in the socket or, uh, or second way, hold this really still and I rotate this around it. So this is the two ways that we can create hip action. The legs are actually like one of the heaviest parts of the body. Pelvis and legs are one of the heaviest parts of the body. The legs are actually levers that can kind of help move the pelvis in certain directions. So as we move forward into our mobility work, we'll, we'll see the value in being able to do one thing still, one thing moving. One thing still, one thing moving. Big, big value in that. Um, so that's how the, the joint is structured. Now we can go over what the joint does. So the joint is a, a, a true ball and socket joint, which means it has tons of mobility, has six different joint actions that it can do. It can flex or extend, it can internally and externally rotate, and it can adduct and abduct. The reason why I put this on three fingers instead of six is that these are sort of like different pairs of opposites. So flexion, extension, one opposite, internal, external rotation, second opposite, adduct, abduct, third opposite. So you can only do one or the other of each one of these pairs of opposites, right? But then among that, you can start combining. So you can do internal rotation and flexion. You can do external rotation and abduction. So all these different things that you can do. So let's look at what these are. Let's start with flexion. Let's assume that this is like a neutral hip position here where the thigh goes into the pelvis. The thigh is neutral, the pelvis is neutral. If I want to take myself into flexion, I'm going to essentially move my thigh and my belly closer together with one joint change, not several joint changes, one joint change. If I want to flex, I'm rotating the pelvis over the heads of the thigh bones to come more forward. Okay, I'm going to go up and down a little bit. It's easier to do when I'm standing, but for these purposes, I think you get it. Okay, flexion. Extension is the exact opposite. So let's see. If flexion is when the thigh and the belly move closer together, even like right now what I'm doing, this is flexion. This is 90 degrees of flexion, right? Because neutral is just like a full vertical line of the body. So this is already like partial flexion. So if flexion is thighs and, and belly moving closer together, what's extension? It's when the, the thighs and belly move farther apart. So if I were to get myself into some extension here, okay, um, some extension here, gotta be neutral. I'm gonna get my hand here so I can feel my frontal hip bone so I can make sure that it's not moving because I don't want my pelvis to move with me, right? I wanna keep my pelvis nice and still and just move my thigh bone in the pelvic socket. So I, I'm gonna hold on here so I can feel my body. I'm gonna hold on over here so I can get a little bit more stability. And from here, I'm just gonna get real sensitive, as sensitive as I can, move this knee back without trying to disturb the pelvis. And now you can see it's very subtle but the thigh is now moving down away from the abdomen, which is moving up towards the armpit. So now I'm getting a stretch through this whole area. So one of the things to keep in mind is that for most people, we can, it's possible in our soft tissues, if we develop them to their capacity, it's possible to have full flexion. Full flexion is like belly and thigh, like totally touching. It's possible to have full flexion here. It's possible to have full flexion here. It's possible to have full flexion standing and doing all these other things, right? Um, extension doesn't work the same way. For most people, we have a very limited hip extension between zero, hello, zero, and 15 degrees. So it's not much. That's why what you, what you just saw me do was quite subtle. Um, so with hip extension, I think it's important to just keep in mind like what our expectations are uh, we can talk about where these two different hip actions show up in our yoga practice. For flexion, forward fold. Downward facing dog, standing forward fold. 
anytime you're picking a leg up. So every time you're walking, for example, and you pick a leg up to move forward and propel you forward, flexing the hips. Um, extension shows up in our yoga practice in back bends, which combines with sp uh, spinal extension. But it also shows up in our lunges. So the back leg is always kind of taking it itself into extension. But what's our front leg doing in a lunge? It's flexing. So this kind of highlights, like I know lunges are very common and we can sort of think of them as like sort of elementary poses, but they're quite complex. Two different hip actions. And our job is to not just like willy nilly put ourselves into a shape that seems okay and then just expect that we're getting the benefits. No, we have to be very deliberate with how we're creating those joint actions so that we can train our, our tissues to adapt to what their job is supposed to be, okay? So flexion and extension, that's two of our joint actions. The next set is um, internal external rotation. External rotation shows up a lot of places in our yoga practice. Even if I just like take my legs out, Mm, some degree I can feel I'm rolling them out. External rotation. External rotation. So things like butterfly pose, all of that kind of stuff. It's when the legs physically rotate in their socket away from the midline of the body. So um, if that's where was I? If that's external rotation, that shows up everywhere. That shows up warrior two, horse pose, all, this pose, yogi squat, all the, all the things, right? Then you have internal rotation, somewhat different, right? This one, it's rolling in now towards the midline. Yoga is a little bit more limited in terms of the, the, the classic poses with internal ro rotation, something like a hero's pose. Da, 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 da. This is kind of intense though. Eagle pose does another, is another one that does a good job with it. So essentially when we get to our module, when we start looking at more internal rotation, we're gonna be borrowing movements from Pilates, strength training, physical therapy, to make sure that we're really training our hips ability to do that internal rotation. The last set of actions that the, that the joint can do are abduction and adduction. This is legs moving farther away and closer. So when they move farther away, abduction. When they move close together, adduction. The way I remember that is adding is like adding the legs back in to the body and abduct, I just remember it's the other one. So um, again, shows up in our yoga practice in a lot of different areas. There's more abduction, I would say, than like active adduction. Usually our adduction like when our legs are just standing underneath us, it's pretty, um, pretty passive. But there are things like crow pose. If you know that arm balance where you're like squeezing your legs in, you know, think of those machines at the gym where you squeeze your legs in. Um, so what we're basically gonna do is we're gonna take those different joint actions and we're gonna spread them out over the next few weeks so we can really do a good job of training all of them, learning how to assess for ourselves, what, am, what are my limitations? Uh, where's my work? Where should I be working? What should I be focusing on? Uh, I think our hips are all built differently, not just from the structure genetically, but uh, most often from our histories of how we've been using them, suboptimal patterning, patterning that we've been doing, either through different forms of exercise or from non-exercise, as the case may be. Uh, so that's what these next few weeks are gonna have in store for us. So we went over the structure, we went over the joint actions. Now let's talk about the muscles that are responsible for creating those joint actions. So last time when we were talking about our knee, we talked a little bit about the muscles on the front and the backs of the legs. So muscles on the front of the leg, the quadriceps, called that way because there's four muscles. Three of those muscles start on the upper thigh, they come down, they cross the knee joint and attach to the front of the, thigh, uh, the, front of the shin bone in what's called the patellar tendon patellar because the anatomical term for kneecap is patella. So they all come to, they're big and thick, right? They're big, thick because they're all super strong, but then they come down and they narrow in and they all go down. So three of them start up here, but one of our sweet little quadriceps actually comes up and crosses our hip joint and attaches right up here to our ASIS, our frontal hip bones. So for this one, 
It's also, imagine it gets shorter. What might it do for us? It might pull the leg up, right? So one of our uh, quadriceps helps us flex our hips, but for the most part, our quadriceps are really just responsible for straightening our legs. And when the hips are in different positions, like right now my hips are, are flexed at 90 degrees, uh, you'll see, if you're on the floor right now, you can try it, like how, how much space do your, do your quadriceps have to straighten the legs? And where is the limitation coming from? It's probably not coming from the quads, it's probably coming from their opposite, the hammies back here. So that's where we can, what we can talk about next. So if our quadriceps job, they contract, they get short and they straighten our leg, then what do you think our hamstrings job is on the back of the leg? They contract, they get short, they bend the leg. So the hamstring muscles, again, a group of three, which we'll see in this whole area, it's not like one single muscle ever, it's always like now a group because they're party packing it in, so they have a lot of power to generate because this is like, the, the pelvis is our center of our propulsion forward. So we need a lot of force there to be able to move ourselves through space. So these three little hamstrings of ours, they start up here at the sitting bones. So they're a two joint muscle, they cross two joints. Up here at the sitting bones, they're right up here. They come all the way down and they attach to either side of the lower leg. Two of our hamstrings flow in, one of our hamstrings flows to the outside. And again, their job, you squeeze them, you contract and the knee bends. Like this is crazy. If you wanna try what I'm doing right here, your hamstring might cramp, cramp out on you. Hello, my sweet hammy, don't cramp out. Do cramp out, it's good. Okay, that was a little pep talk. <laughs> so we have um, the fronts of the legs, the backs of the legs. Now we can talk about what happens on the insides of the legs. So a big group of muscles over here, about six, called the adductor muscles. They're called the adductor muscles because you can maybe see like if they squeeze and get shorter, they bring the leg in. Okay, so these all, these are muscles that all come up through the inner thigh. They attach right in here to the front of the pelvis at the pubis, the lower pelvis right here. So they can help with when they get shorter, they can also help with flexing the hip then, right? They also help with some rotational aspects, but primarily their job is to bring the leg into the midline and stabilize it there. So these muscles, they all come up, they, they get very narrow and they attach just like a one inch like little tendon up here. But then what's kind of interesting about them is that they go down and, and, and they don't attach in like a small spot on the thigh bone, which I think is sometimes how I conceptualize of muscles attaching in like these small areas. But actually these muscles attach along the whole ridge on the backside of the femur. So if you can imagine like the, the tendon being really long there and like a bunch of muscles just kind of like flopping onto the bone there. It's pretty cool. So the last muscle I want to talk about on the front of the body or I could call anterior of the body, since we know what that means now, is our iliopsoas muscle. Again, not one, three muscles, but usually we refer to it as one. The reason why I wanna isolate this is because it's the most powerful hip flexor we have, and it's the only muscle that attaches our legs to our torso. Everything else just stops at the pelvis, but this bad boy goes up the inner thigh to the front of the pelvis, Sounds like some of our other muscles, but then it travels actually through the body and it, it attaches onto the front of the low back spine. Can you imagine that? The front of the low back spine. So the front means like the organ side and it attaches onto several vertebra in the low back. So the way it does that is with like finger-like projections, comes on, grabs onto the low back. So it's really powerful to stabilize the relationship of the pelvis and the spine and the legs with each other. You can see like it crosses a lot of joints there because actually each vertebra in the spine is considered its own joint. So then you're like, wow, that's like a seven or eight joint, <laughs> seven or eight joint muscle that it's crossing right there. So it's very, very powerful. And we'll talk a little bit about like, you know, if any of these areas are tight, like what can happen, but let's finish talking about like our, what we have going on and what their jobs are. So as we now did a good job of talking about like the front and backs of the legs, the last real big component is our butt. So the butt uh, has three uh, big butt muscles. You're probably familiar with at least one, the gluteus maximus. That's the most superficial and the biggest of them. But then we also have the glute medius and the glute minimus that lie underneath that. 
The butt muscles, very big, they span. If you can imagine, like, if you can wrap around and kind of see, like, where's my PSIS, my ASIS? Okay, here they are. Imagine that these muscles attach from this ridge down and they flow down to the top of the thigh bone inside the hip capsule to attach. So our butt muscles are actually so powerful that they control every single joint action. They're not responsible for just one thing. And depending on how well developed they are, you might feel them turn on and trigger an effort in different moments in the practice. Um, I think part of the reason why we have the layering of them is that they're really designed to kick in when you when more force is needed. So it's like when you're walking, you maybe don't even feel your butt muscles turn on, but then you do the same movements, but you speed it up and you turn it into a run. You're generating more force and all of a sudden the glute max needs to turn on to help support that with, when there's more force that's being generated. So. Um, they kind of turn on sequentially in that way and they kind of are gauging like how much work do i need to do here like do you got this no okay i'm gonna get in i'm gonna help you out so besides those three big butt muscles we do have some other tissues that are lie underneath the gluteus maximus uh, they're called the the deep lateral rotators uh, there's about six of them. And again, for our purposes, not super important that we kind of know the, the ins and outs of every single one. Of course, that's up to each of us individually to know how much information is, is valuable to, to have, right? So I just want to go over one of them, which is the piriformis muscle. So the piriformis muscle is one that crosses over uh, the, the leg. It's the one that you feel stretching out when you're in something like a half pigeon if you're familiar with that. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because it lies, A, it crosses the SI joint, which is in the back right here, remember, when we talked about like with the sacrum. So it crosses here, and then as it wraps down and around, it actually goes right over our, uh, our sciatic nerve. And so if it's compressing the sciatic nerve, it's gonna create pain, it may create numbness, it may be in one spot just right there in the hip, it may be shooting down through the leg. And so if this is something you've been dealing with and you've been going to yoga to sort of rehab it, I bet that what you've been getting a lot of is half pigeon or even like instructions to go home and foam roll or maybe even like stick a tennis ball under there and kind of roll it out. And if you find relief in this, that's great. I definitely recommend to keep doing it. But um, the one thing is, is that you may find relief temporarily, but you'll notice that a few hours later, the pain comes back. The reason why the pain's coming back is because we're not doing anything to adapt our tissues to not compress on that nerve. The only way that our tissues adapt is when we apply load and then we ask them to deal with that load for time, time under tension. So this means we need to really focus on developing the strength and stability of these muscles back here if we want long lasting relief from any sort of sciatic nerve uh, compression. So if you're just doing the stretching, great but consider adding in some strengthening stuff for the whole hip capsule. I think you'll go really far. And if you don't know what the next step is, that's great. My next step is keep doing these videos over the next few weeks because you're gonna see. So uh, these are primarily all of the muscles that we use down there. The one last thing that I'd like to go over before we wrap up today is sort of like what can go wrong. So lots of different things can go wrong. I think a lot of this, our issue is that we spend so much time as a culture just sitting. We're not developing these areas of our body. And if you're sitting all day and then you're going to yoga and your emphasis is on stretch, uh, potentially doing even more of a disservice because what we really need is development. We need our muscles to be developed to do the jobs that they are designed to do. And if our muscles are not developed, they're not long enough or they're not strong enough, what can happen is suboptimal uh, pelvis patterning that we can then learn to assess in ourselves and address effectively. So one of our suboptimal patterings might be like, let's say we have really tight hamstrings back here, especially at the top, maybe even our butt is a little bit uh, tight muscles. And so if our hamstrings are tight, remember they attach right up here. Well, if your muscles are tight, they're basically grabbing onto bones to move them. So they're grabbing on the pelvis and pulling it down and forward. And you're going to get something like this. And you can see how up the chain of the body, it's suboptimal all the way up. So what starts in the pelvis doesn't just end there, right? Like everything feels like crap all the way up and above that. 
So if you notice that you're someone who's like this, uh, and that this is just kind of like your normal way of existing through life is like, I have this posterior pelvic tilt. Well then, uh, my friend, we're going to need to work on some flexion for you. We're going to need to work on being able to do this, lengthening out all this area back here. Conversely, you might not be that person. You might be a person like me where my thing is I have a chronic anterior pelvic tilt. See how natural this is for me? I'm just like, uh, oh, it's great. No, it's not great. So if you have this thing going on, maybe it's something in the front of the hips, right? That's short and it's pulling on because we have a lot of muscles that come up and attach right here in these hip bones. If something's tight there, they're just pulling up eh, down, right? Um, alternatively, your hips might be fine. They may be long enough, but what might be happening is that you've learned how to breathe in this upward fashion where the ribs are kind of lifting up and the chest is lifting up and you're breathing here. And if something is lifting up in this way, then something else has to go down in another way to counterbalance it. And that's where you might be getting your pelvic tilt. So very important for us to kind of notice what our patterning is, why the patterning might be that way so that we can figure out like what steps do I need to take to rehab this effectively? Because the truth is when you go to a public class, the teacher is teaching for like, for, for just general in the room, what's going on. I can't address everything. I'm going to address the things that look unsafe. And beyond that, it's really your job as the student to come up afterwards to ask those questions of something doesn't feel right, or I'm not making progress in this area. Right? So that's what this program is designed to help you with, to help you figure all this stuff out on your own. So you don't feel like you're dependent on somebody else having to come in and assess and, and help you out for you. Right? So you can have these pelvic tilts. You might also have something where your pelvis is tilting off to one side like this. This can be caused by uh, legs uh, being uneven as they go up into the pelvis. Imagine like ones like this, right? That would make your pelvis go like this. <laughs> or something's going on in your spine, like a little scoliosis or something like that. So it's all up to us to figure out like, okay, what's my sub, do I have suboptimal patterning? My, my, my guess is that it's yes because it's even yes for me. And then how can I assess it and what are my next steps? So thank you guys so much for joining today. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, before we wrap up, I just wanna invite you to join us on Patreon. That's where uh, you can get all of our resources for this because it's impossible for me to share everything that I'm studying in less than 30 minutes. So join us on there less than a dollar a month. We also have lots of other fantastic ways for you to get in touch with us and us to get in touch with you through that platform. So again, I very much appreciate your time today. I hope this was a half hour well spent and I will see you right here next week for a hip flexion practice.